can get started. Uh, we're, we're recording. Okay, great. So today um, it's going to be an intro to cardiac MRI. And so what I'm going to touch on is, is some of the basic uh, principles of, of uh, MRI imaging. So uh, we got to make sure we don't have the lights too low because uh, otherwise you guys are going to fall asleep. So I'm going to try to, you know, I'll consider it success if I don't see anybody nodding off uh, uh, during this uh, next 45 minutes or so. So obviously as a background uh, in cardiac imaging, you know, we've got a rich heritage uh, with echocardiography in the 1970s. Uh, nuclear cardiology really came about in the 80s. And then uh, cardiac MR and CT, I think, are techniques that uh, really came about in uh, the 21st century. Um, and here's an example of an MRI scanner and what it looks like. And this is actually a picture of our scanner that we have over on Main 2. Uh, you can see it's a, a donut type machine. And there's a table that the patient lays on. And then once the patient lays on the table, we bring the table up. And the table actually then goes into the center of the magnet, what we call the bore of the magnet. And then obviously, we can utilize MRI for a variety of different applications. Uh, and over the course of this year, for this conference, we're going to go through and talk about a variety of these different applications for CMR, uh, more from the standpoint of disease state as opposed to imaging itself. Uh, and so that's what you have, I think, to, to be look forward to over the course of the, the rest of this academic year. And so today I want to start out with, you know, first off, who are these two guys here? Just two old guys. So there are actually two well-known uh, individuals within the MRI community, uh, Peter Mansfield and uh, Paul uh, Lauterberg. And uh, their claim to fame was that they actually developed uh, the concept of MRI. And they actually received the Nobel Prize in Medicine for this uh, in 2003. But when did they first do their first human experiment, their first human subject? 1969, 1980? 1977. Okay, how many people say 69? One person. How many say 1980? Two, three people. How many say 1977? Okay, so we got about five people. We got a lot of people that are abstaining. So you got to remember, you got to pick one or the other. So uh, in fact, it was 1977 when they did their first human experiment. So the most of you are right uh, if we don't count the abstainers. Uh, the other question is, what's the most important element when it comes to MRI imaging for, a human, for the human body? Is it oxygen? Raise your hand. Is it hydrogen? Raise your hand. Or is it carbon? Raise your hand. Okay, so this is what we did good on. Most people got it, which is that hydrogen is what we use today for most of our MRI imaging. And there's a very good reason for that, and that's because two-thirds of the body is in fact composed of water, which is hydrogen. So it gives you a very, very strong signal. Now, there's two ways, you know, when you talk about doing electron MRI physics, we could make it very complicated, or we could try to make it very simple and just talk about the images. What I'm going to do is try to do is straddle a line in between these two. So obviously, uh, it involves a magnetic field, and the other thing that's important to keep in mind it involves radio waves, okay? Uh, and these are the basic things that we really need is a, a person or a body or something to, to image a magnetic field and radio waves and then from that we're able to generate images. Now obviously it's a little bit more complex than that um, and so I'm going to try to walk you through what is you know, that, that example scanner or the MR system that I showed you, what are actually the components of it? And it's important to know the terminology um, because you don't want to just say well it's that little donut thing. Uh, so obviously as I talked about before the inside of that is called a bore, the, M, the magnetic bore, okay? And that's what the patient goes inside of. And then we also have a, a reference coordinate system, an XYZ coordinate system, which again, Z would be uh, in the head to foot direction here, and then X and Y would be uh, within any given, within the plane direction, all right? Now, a couple of things to keep in mind is inside of the scanner itself, you've got a, a few different things. Obviously, you've got the table, that is able to move in and out. That's what the patient lays on top of. Uh, and then there's also the main magnetic coils, which are all in this donut type thing here. Uh, and these, as we'll talk about, give it the main magnetic field. But then in addition to that, 
There's also a set of X, Y, and Z gradient coils. And these gradient coils then cause a slight alteration to the magnetic field. And then in addition to that, there's an integrated RF transmitter inside of here as well, which actually transmits radio frequency energy or radio frequency waves. Okay? So really we're talking about the main magne magnetic coils, the gradient coils, RF radio frequency or RF as we call it, RF transmitter coil. And then in addition to that, there's radio frequency receiver coils. Now the receiver coils can be actually, there's some that are within the bore, of, or there's some that are within the, the magnet itself. And then there's also receiver coils that we place on the patient. So if any of you have seen an MRI scan being done or had one done, you'll notice that you go into the scanner, but you also get some little coils placed on top of you. So those are receiver coils that are designed to be placed very close to the object of imaging to help improve the uh, uh, image resolution and image quality. So the main magnet uh, we're talking about is a strong, uh, very strong magnetic field and that defines the strength of the MRI system. So in clinical practice today, in routine clinical practice, what are the strengths of magnetic fields that we're utilizing? Like 1.5. Okay, so 1.5 what? Tesla. 1.5 Tesla. Uh, what else? Is there any other field strength that we typically utilize in clinical practice besides 1.5? Three Tesla, right? So those are two main ones that are used now today, 1.5 and three Tesla. But in the early days, the, the magnets were actually not as strong as that. And there were some one Tesla magnets and even some 0.5 Tesla magnets. And if you go to places that, where they have an open MRI scanner, so it's not that circular bore, uh, those tend to be lower magnetic fields. So the reality is you can go anywhere from 0.5, probably up to three Tesla for kind of clinical application today. And then, in fact, the strongest magnetic fields, or the strongest magnets, are as high as 21 Tesla, but those are not for kind of routine clinical application. So what is a Tesla? Besides the car. Okay. So a Tesla is equivalent to 20,000 times the Earth's magnetic field. Okay. So now, remember, the Earth has two types of fields. There's a magnetic field and a gravitational field, right? Don't get the two mixed up. So this is, we're talking about the magnetic field of the Earth. One Tesla equals 20,000 times that. And then we already talked a little bit about this reference coordinate system that we have, which is basically X, Y, and Z uh, coordinate system that we'll utilize. Um, and then let's go into a little bit more detail of what are these gradient coils. So I talked about the fact that the gradient coils are actually within the uh, mag magnet or the MR system itself. And what are these? So basically, the purpose of gradient coils is to generate a alteration to the magnetic field. All right? And um, they're going to be aligned in a variety of different directions. They're, they're going to be in the same direction as, as the, the B naught or the, the main magnetic field. But they can also be aligned in, in other directions as well. So you essentially have a gradient in all three directions, okay? Just like you have the XYZ coordinate system, you have the ability to create an alteration of the magnetic field in all three of those uh, uh, planes, in the X, Y, and Z plane. And then we actually define the strength of the gradient as the steepness of the slope. And that's measured in millitesla per meter. So any MRI scanner that you buy, this will be one of the specs that you'll get. Just like if you go buy a, a Tesla car, and it will have the specs of what's the battery life or what's the, uh, the size of the engine. The same way, this is a spec for a scanner, which is the strength of the gradient. And in addition to that, there's another thing called the slew rate, which is how fast it achieves that gradient. Okay? So the strength means that within, so if you have a patient laying in the magnetic field, then for every meter from the center or isocenter of the magnet, it's able to generate a one, or, or it's able to generate whatever millitesla of an increase or decrease in the magnetic field uh, for every meter uh, away from the isocenter that you're at, all right? So the typical order of gradient strengths that we get for most clinical systems is on the order of about 30 to 45 millitesla per meter, okay? The other thing is, as I talked about as a slew rate, is how fast it's able to achieve that gradient. And obviously the faster it's able to achieve that gradient, the faster your imaging can be done. Uh, and so that's also important is the speed. And again, the range of slew rates for most scanners is between 100 
and 200 millitesla per meter uh, per minute. Um, okay, the other thing is we talked about is the radio frequency coils. So these are the coils uh, that uh, are, tr or there's two kinds of radio frequency coils. There's transmit coils and there's receive coils. So the transmit coils are generally, play generally within the MRI system itself and they basically are able to send in a radio frequency wave. So they transmit a radio frequency wave to the uh, object that's in the MRI scanner uh, that's being imaged. And then uh, that object then will get excited by these radio frequency waves and then it will then release or, or uh, remit a signal back, uh, which we call an echo. Okay, so um, the for the for the receiving of the coils, the closer you are to the object you're interested in imaging, the better the signal you're going to get, and the less noise you're going to pick up. So it's the same thing as if I, you know I've got a radio station which is transmitting radio waves, and then I've got a, a uh, radio receiver here, which is receiving the radio waves, the closer I am to the radio station, the better the signal I'm going to get. And as I start driving away, if any of you have done any long distance driving, as you start driving further and further away, this, this, the signal gets weaker. So you pick up more noise and less signal. So the signal and noise gets worse. Uh, so the idea is the closer your coils are, the better uh, imaging you're going to be able to achieve. The more signal you're going to achieve relative to noise. Now, let's talk a little bit about the origins of the MR signal. So we said, obviously, hydrogen is the main uh, species that we're going to utilize. But in fact, you can do uh, imaging with phosphorus, uh, sodium, uh, as well as carbon, because all of these also will uh, have magnetic properties uh, and therefore will emit magnetic signal. Um, but obviously, the advantage of hydrogen is that it's abundant in water. And also, there's a large amount of hydrogen and fat as well. And so the other thing to keep in mind is this concept of nuclear spins. And that's the idea that uh, as these hydrogen protons uh, are placed into a magnetic field, they have a certain rate that they spin around at. Okay? And the rate that they spin around at, you can think of it as you know, a bunch of tops or a bunch of you know, objects that are spinning around. Uh, and they can be lined upright. They can be lined down. They can be in any direction. Uh, but they're going to be constantly spinning around. And in, in the outside of a magnetic field, they're going to be uh, rotating or spinning in a random orientation. But once you place them inside a magnetic field, what happens is they begin to align with the magnetic field. Now, you'll notice in this cartoon that I drew here, not every single proton is lined upright, right? Uh, and in fact, if you talk about it at one Tesla, uh, we're really talking about one in a million more protons that's lined upright versus down. So there's some that are up, some that are down, but the net, if you add it all together, is that there's a net in the positive direction. Okay? So that's what determines, or, or that's what causes th these uh, protons to become more, uh, oriented in a certain fashion. That's the magnetic field that they come in contact with. So as a result, think of the concept of net magnetization. All right. So the other thing to keep in mind is that the frequency that these protons are going to spin around at is going to be directly related to the strength of the magnetic field that they're in contact with. So, for example, and, and it's using this equation right here called the Larmor equation, which basically says the precession frequency is equal to a certain ratio, the gear magnetic ratio, which depends on each nuclei times the magnetic field strength. All right? So it'll be different for carbon, fluoride, or phosphorus. But for hydrogen, uh, it, the gear magnetic ratio is 42 megahertz per tesla. And therefore, at a 1.5 tesla field strength, the hydrogen protons would spin around at a frequency of 64 megahertz. All right? Now, if you go to 3 tesla, then what's the frequency that they're going to spin around at? Well, they'll spin around at 128 megahertz. All right? So protons are spinning at a certain frequency. And that frequency is directly related to the magnetic field that's present. Now remember, there's two things to keep in mind. There's B0, which is the static magnetic field. All right, that's what 1.5 or T3 uh, Tesla, that's your MRI scanner itself. But then there's also uh, a thing called B1, which is the local magnetic field. 
And again, the gradients will cause an alteration to that local magnetic field. All right? So again, if we think about it, if you have a patient who's outside of the scanner, then there's no net magnetization. Once you put the patient into the magnetic field, then you've got your B naught, which is aligned uh, obviously in, in the direction of the magnetic field and has a certain strength to it, which is a function of whichever scanner you have. So in this case, let's say it's 1.5 Tesla. Well then, well, what will happen is the uh, local magnetic field that the tissue uh, is going to experience is now going to be equivalent to your B naught. So it's going to be 1.5 Tesla as well. All right. So by putting a patient into the scanner, you've induced now a uh, magnetization of the protons within the, the patient's body. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that in the resting state or in the equilibrium state, the, the protons are going to be lined up in the net positive direction, right? So they're going to be lined up in the direction of the magnetic field. That's equilibrium, all right? So at equilibrium, your B naught equals your M naught. So B naught is the static magnetic field, which is 1.5 Tesla. M naught is the local magnetic field that the protons within your body are seeing. Now, the uh, size of your M naught is one of the key determinants of the maximum signal intensity that you're going to get. So as a result, if I'm in a higher field strength, if I'm in 3 Tesla, my B naught is higher, and therefore my M naught is going to be higher as well. All right, because the, the proton or the body tissue will now have a higher magnetic field uh, in, the in the equilibrium state inside of an MRI scanner. So therefore, that's why higher field strengths give you higher signal to noise, give you more signal, okay, give you more signal intensity. All right. Now, uh, the other aspect to this is that we're going to actually now transmit or send in a radio frequency pulse. All right. And the purpose of this is to cause excitation. All right, so it gives energy to the protons. So that radio frequency pulse that's being transmitted uh, basically then gets absorbed by the protons in the body. And those protons then go from their upright resting state. They then become uh, moved into the transverse plane. All right, so you're causing essentially what we call a flip. So the protons go from being upright to now being into the transverse plane which in this case will be defined as the, the y-axis. And this is what's called an excitation pulse. So it's an RF transmitted pulse that causes excitation of protons. All right? Um, and we can have a variety of different radio frequency excitation pulses. It can be, and we define it really as the, um, the degree of, to which it causes a uh, rotation of this magnetization vector. So in this example here, a 90 degree flip would cause this magnetization vector to go from being upright to being in the completely transverse plane. And then on the flip side, if we did a shallower pulse than 90 degrees, then for example, a 45 degree pulse would cause this net magnetization to be such that it's only tipped over by 45 degrees. So now you have some component in the transverse plane, but you still have some residual component in the longitudinal plane. All right, so with a 90 degree pulse, you get complete transfer of magnetization from the longitudinal plane into the transverse plane. And with less than 90 degree pulses, you get a partial transfer, so you still have some residual longitudinal magnetization. Whereas with a 90 degree pulse, you have zero net longitudinal magnetization after you apply your 90 degree pulse. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so. Um, the, that's what's called a flip angle, okay? Um, and obviously, a 90 degree flip angle is going to give you the highest transfer of magnetization from longitudinal to transverse plane. All right. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, and this is just an example of that, uh, when I apply 90 degree pulse, I now no longer have any longitudinal magnetization, but I have uh, a large amount of magnetization within my transverse plane. The other thing to keep in mind is, remember I said the protons are spinning around? Well, just because I caused them to, to go from the longitudinal plane into the transverse plane, it doesn't stop them from spinning around. So they continue to spin around, but now they're spinning around in the transverse plane. And so, let's get past this here. So I've got a little schematic here, which I think hopefully will, will point out exactly what's happening. 
So if you apply 90 degree pulse, you notice these protons now are spinning around, not in the upright, but in the transverse plane. Now, you can think of it this way. You can think of it as everything is spinning around, or we can rotate our reference uh, spot as well. And as a result, we essentially make everything look stationary. But you'll notice one thing, which is that these protons, which initially were separating from each other, right? That's a, con that's a concept called dephasing, which is because they are, al although they're all spinning around, they may be spinning around at slightly different rates, m you know, minor differences in rates that causes them to all get dispersed. All right. The, the, the best way you can think of this is think of it if you're at a racetrack uh, or, or you're at a, a track and you have a bunch of runners that are lined up and then you say go. Well, what will happen is, you know, if you look at it from the sky at the very beginning, you see a big mass of people right at the starting line. But then over time, that mass will start to separate out. And if you wait long enough, people will be kind of equally dispersed around the racetrack so that you get zero net signal. Because if you add up the direction that all the runners are at, in the end, you end up with zero if, you, if everyone's equally spaced out. All right, so, so that's a basic concept be behind uh, the, what happens. So, so what we're getting now to is a concept of relaxation. All right, and so with MR relaxation, so it's not sitting at the beach and reading MRI scans. Uh, what we're talking about with MR relaxation is two phenomenon, all right? There's the relaxation that occurs in the longitudinal plane. So remember I said that if you're in a magnetic field, the resting or the low energy state, the equilibrium state, is for the protons to be lined upright, all right? So once you tip them down, they're going to want to go back to the upright plane again, right? Just like a rubber band, all right? Because that's a low energy state uh, inside of a magnetic field. And so after you apply an RF pulse, you then have a return of your longitudinal magnetization back to, uh, eventually back to the full resting state, which is going to be equivalent to your B naught. All right? But it takes time to achieve that. And that relaxation uh, is what we call T1 relaxation. Okay? Uh, there's also another principle, which is that in the transverse plane, at the same time, these protons, as they start to become separated from each other, let's go back to that, uh, this uh, animation again. And as you'll see, these protons, as they're spinning around, they start separating from each other. And as a result of that separation, the net magnetization vector becomes gradually less and less and less. And that's what's shown over here on the right-hand side. And so as that net magnetization becomes less and less and less, that is your T2 or your T2 star decay, all right? So you have relaxation, which causes recovery in the longitudinal plane, and it causes a loss of uh, a signal or loss of uh, energy in the transverse plane. Uh, and so those are the basic differences between T1 and T2, all right? Now, it's important to keep in mind these are happening at the same time, all right? So there are two concurrent phenomena that are happening at the same time. And also important to keep in mind in general, T1 is slower than T2. All right, so here's an example of T1 relaxation. So if I tip my proton from the upright state with a 90 degree flip angle into the transverse plane, then at the start of this, the component or the vector I have in the longitudinal plane is how much? Zero. Right, so it's a simple answer. I mean, there's no, right, there's no net vector in the longitudinal plane here, okay? Now, what happens over time is that that net vector keeps growing, right? And the rate at which it grows at is related to your T1, okay? And then T1 time is, a, is defined as the amount of time it takes to regrow to 63% of the intrinsic or equilibrium magnetization, all right? That's your T1 time. So after a 90 degree flip, you have zero magnetization and you see the recovery and the speed at which it recovers determines your T1 time. So if something has faster recovery, then will its T1 time be shorter or longer? Faster recovery? Yeah, if something that has a faster T1 recovery would have a shorter T1 time, right? Because it would get to that 63% point at a shorter time interval, so it would have a shorter T1 time. And then on the flip side, something that has a slow T1 recovery would have a long T1 time, okay? And uh, 
that's what this is just showing you here. Short T1 time equals fast T1 relaxation, and long T1 time equals slow T1 relaxation. Uh, now what causes this? So this is an energy release from the proton population as it returns back to equilibrium, and it's related to the size and tumbling rate of the molecules, okay? So that's kind of a, a mouthful there, but this is just showing you schematically the fact that, that this property is dependent on the tissue. It's, in, it's different for each tissue. So fat has a very fast rate of T1 recovery and therefore a very short T1 time. On the flip side, water has a very slow rate of T1 recovery and therefore a very long T1 time. And then myocardium is somewhere in between. Okay. Now, the other thing we talked about uh, before briefly was the fact that, uh, remember I said as, as you tip protons into the transverse plane, they began to eventually separate from each other. They began to become out of phase or dephased, all right? Well, the net angle that the protons are at at any given instance is going to be your phase angle, all right? And just bear with me on this. I'll explain that, this to you in a second. But the way you can think of it is that if all the spins are spinning at the same time, then they're all going to have at any given time point the same phase angle, uh, and they'll all be considered to be in phase, right? So the way you can think of it, if I give you an oversimplification, is I think of it as a racetrack. And at a certain time, if everyone's running together, well, they'll all be a certain distance away from the starting line, right? I can actually measure that angle. And then at a, at a certain time later, they'll all be a, at a different angle from the starting line but they'll all be together, right? So if they're all running in phase, then the longer I wait after I hit go, or after I say, say go in a race, they're, they're gonna all have a slightly different phase or a slightly different point angle from the, finish, from the starting line uh, where they started at. So, uh, so over time, after we apply an RF pulse, what happens is these phase angles gradually become spread out or become dephased, so they lose coherence, okay? And, and again, this is what leads to the principle of T2 decay, all right? And this is due to a variety of, of reasons. One is due to neighbor protons, so there's a, what's called a spin-spin interaction, uh, which is exponential and it's irreversible. And then there's also called a, or there's also a component of this that's due to field inhomogeneities that are local sta static variations in the magnetic field. This is constant and it's potentially reversible, okay? So again, this is a mouthful, but let's go through wh what we talk about here or what I mean by here is when I tip these protons down, they're gonna all start to slightly come out of phase with each other and the longer I wait, the more and more they come out of phase and as a result, the net vector, if I summate all these vectors together, uh, over time gets gradually less and less and less, and that's my T2 decay. And this obviously, uh, the longer I wait, the closer and closer the net vector gets to essentially zero. And this now is only in the transverse plane. Remember, the longitudinal plane recovery is happening at the same time in a se separate direction. What we're looking at here is simply what's happening in the transverse plane. And so this decay that occurs uh, is T2, and T2 time is defined as the amount of time it takes to lose or to, to decay to 37% of the intrinsic magnetization, all right? So if you tip the protons down into the transverse plane, at time equals zero, you have 100% transverse magnetization, and over time, that net vector becomes smaller and smaller, and once you get down to 37% of that, that's your T2 time. So with T2, the tissue that has fast T2 decay are going to have short T2 recovery times, and tissues that have very slow T2 decay are going to have long T2 times. And so water has very long T2 times, uh, whereas something like uh, fat or myocardium is going to have relatively shorter T2 times. But you'll notice the order of magnitudes that we're talking about here are much less than the orders of magnitude that we're talking about for T1 time, right? Because for T1 times, we're talking about on the order of hundreds to thousands of milliseconds, whereas with T2 decay times, we're talking about on the order of tens to hundred milliseconds, all right? So 
by, by knowing these different properties of different tissue, we can actually use this to then, uh, let's get past this here, uh, identify characteristics of tissue. So I've got two different acquisitions that I've done here. This acquisition on the left here, so look at this big little mass here, this big cystic mass that I see. And this is done using a T2 weighted acquisition technique. And on the right hand side, this is done, I'm sorry, this is done using a T1 acquisition technique. This is done using a T2 weighted acquisition technique. So when we talk about weighting, what that means is that this image here, the signal intensity is going to be a function of the T2 or the T1 of the tissue. All right? So we said water has, what's a T1 of water? Is it long or short? Long. 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 So if it's long T1 and I do a T1 weighted acquisition, then it's going to give me low signal. Right? On the flip side, what is a T1 of fat? Short. Short. So if I do a T1 weighted acquisition, then fat will give me high signal. And so in this case here in the chest wall, I see very high signal <coughs> from the fat in the chest wall, whereas this cystic mass here, I see low signal, suggesting in fact that the T1 properties of this will be consistent with something that has long T1 re uh, relaxation times, something like water. And then the way we confirm that is now, if I do a T2 acquisition, what is the T2 properties of water? Very it's very long. And so if something has long T2, then on a T2 acquisition, it's going to have high signal. So long T2 will have high signal on a T2 acquisition, and therefore this thing shows very high signal. So that's how I confirm, in fact, that this, what I'm seeing here, is actually a water-filled structure or a pericardial cyst, essentially. All right? But this is kind of the basic principle by which we do these tissue characterization techniques. <laughs> so next, I'm going to talk about how we use this to actually make an image. Okay, folks? And it's going to be a beautiful image that MR makes. All right, so first step is slice selection. All right, so we've got to pick the slice that we want to image. Next thing we're going to do is the phase encoding. And the third thing we're going to do is frequency encoding. Now, I could simplify this for you and say slice selection, you can think of it as picking my z-axis. And then the phase and the frequency are now encoding my image in the x and y planes. All right? So uh, obviously, the, you know, in reality, there's a lot more complexity to this. But what I'm trying to show you here is kind of a, a simplified version of, of what happened. So we talked earlier about gradients. So again, what is the purpose of the gradients? What do the gradients do? OK, Mawash is a good reader here. Uh, so the answer is right up there. So everyone should be reading that, right? So, so if you're not, I mean, I'm worried if you're falling asleep. And my goal, remember, for this talk was to make sure nobody falls asleep. And uh, just let me check, make sure nobody is. OK, good. Nobody's falling asleep so far. So yeah, gradients basically cause a alteration to the magnetic field, OK, locally. So the, the static magnetic field is the same. So it's a 1.5 Tesla scanner. It's a 1.5 Tesla. But what I can do is I can cause, within that, I can cause a slight distortion to the magnetic field. If I apply a gradient, in this case, in the head to foot direction, the net effect of that will be that the magnetic field at the head will be a little bit different than the magnetic field at the center versus that at the feet. Now, the order of magnitude we're talking about here is very, very minuscule, right? So if we say it's a 1.5 Tesla system, then at isocenter, which is the center of my gradient, right, there's no net alteration. So it's 1.5 Tesla. Maybe at the head, it'll be 1.50001 Tesla. And maybe at the feet, I'll make it 1.4999 Tesla. So we're talking about very minor changes in the magnetic field. So the static magnetic field is B0. When I apply a gradient to cause an alteration to the magnetic field, that's called B1. Okay? So that's an alteration to the magnetic field that's caused by the gradient. And then obviously what the tissue sees is called M or M0. Okay? So when I cause a alteration to the magnetic field, now if you think back to that Larmor equation, and what was that Larmor equation again? Who are we going to pick on? Mm -hmm. Opena, you looked at me first. So, What was that Larmor equation? <laughs> 
Right, so gear magnetic ratio, which is a fixed ratio, times the magnetic field, okay? So therefore, if the magnetic field of the brain is higher, right, so instead of 1.5 Tesla, it's 1.5001 Tesla, then the protons there are going to be spinning at a slightly different frequency, right? That's, again, that goes back to that basic Larmor equation, which is a basic physics principle. So if I now know, if I apply this gradient, and this is what we call the slice select gradient, I now know that if I want to image the head, I'm going to send in protons or send in a radio frequency wave, not at 64 megahertz, but maybe at 64.1 megahertz. And by doing that, only the protons in the head will get excited. The rest of the body will not get excited. All right, is that, is that principle make sense to everybody? Because you got to understand that. All right, so, so I'm actually now selecting the slice that I want it to image by picking a certain frequency of protons. Because remember, only the protons that are frequency or that are spinning at the frequency uh, that you set will actually receive that signal, right? will receive that energy. So, so you can think of it as if protons are spinning around at uh, 64 megahertz, and if I send in an RF wave at 64 megahertz, they'll receive that, they'll absorb that energy. The energy transfer only occurs if the radio frequency wave is at the same frequency as the protons are spinning at, right? On the other hand, if I send in a uh, radio frequency wave at 65 megahertz, but pro the spins are spinning at 64 megahertz, they won't get that energy. There won't be that energy transfer that occurs, right? I mean, the simple way you can think about it is if I have a, uh, you know, one of those things called those pendulums, right? If it's swinging, and if I, at the same time, I, ha I move my hand at a certain rate, well, if I'm moving my hand at the same rate that this thing is spinning at, I'll hit it, right? But if I'm moving my hand at a different rate than the rate at which my pendulum is spin spinning at, I, I won't make contact, and therefore there'll be no energy transfer, all right? So this right here allows me to pick the slice that I'm interested in imaging. Uh, by applying this gradient and applying a radio frequency pulse that corresponds to the specific location or the specific slice that I want to image. So that's your slice select gradient. Uh, that now excites one particular slice. And the thickness of that is determined by the bandwidth as well as the steepness. So again, this is getting now into more second and third order things. But the basic thing I want you to understand is simply the concept of slice selection. And that's made possible by applying a gradient. Okay? Because if I send in a radio frequency wave of 64.1 megahertz, but I don't apply a gradient, and all the protons are at 64 megahertz, there, there will be no energy transfer. The protons will not get excited. All right? So the next step, because there's two more steps in this. So we've, we've now picked the z axis because I'm only exciting one particular slice. The next step now are two more things, which are called phase encode. Uh, and the idea here is that protons will rotate at different frequencies along the y axis uh, based on this phase encode gradient. And then the third is the frequency encode gradient, which you can think of as along the x-axis. Now, the reality is I can change these. This x, y, and z is not an atomic coordinates. You can make it whatever you want. You can flip it around however you want to. Um, but th these two gradients right here, uh, once I've picked my slice of interest, allows me to basically encode in the x and y direction. All right? Um, so. Let, let's go through and talk about how that works. And, and again, the gradient, so if, if any of you have been, how many of you have been to an MRI scanner? Nobody? How many of you have been outside of an MRI scanner? In a, okay, a few of you, right? What's the first, what's probably the most memorable part of that experience? The noise. noise. Right, well, so yes, the, the noise, right? Uh, you hear the noise. So what causes that noise? What's causing that noise? So that's the gradients. So when you're switching on these gradients, that's what causes that noise, right? Because you're you're, the way that you create these gradients is by sending an electrical, uh, you know, pulse of electrical energy to the gradients that causes then uh, all of a sudden a rapid switch in the gradients that causes a magnetic field to be induced, right? Or an alteration to the magnetic field. So it's that noise that you're hearing that's causing that to happen. And again, those gradients you have in all three axes, right? So we talked about the slice direction already. That's to pick the slice that we want to excite. Now what we need to do is figure out within the x and y plane how we encode our image, all right? And so there's a second gradient we can apply, which is going to be in the frequency direction, 
all right? Which basically then will cause the protons at here to spin at a little bit of a different frequency than the protons here, right? So this is how you basically encode where, where whether the signal you're getting back is coming from protons that are here versus here is based on what frequency are they spinning at, right? Because again, if I cause a gradient now in this direction, right, in my left or right direction, then the protons in this column are going to be spinning at a slightly different frequency than the protons in this column here are. And based on the differences, I can, and, and knowing how I applied my gradient, I can then determine that this thing is situated here, whereas this thing is situated over here. Okay, so that's how I'm encoding now in the x-axis. And then the last step is how do I encode in the y-axis? So this is the one that's a little bit more complicated. So this is the one that takes time, which is basically I can apply now, in addition to my x-axis, I can apply in my y-axis a gradient. And the net effect of this is because the protons are spinning at slightly different frequencies, remember, if they're all spinning together, they're all lined up. But if they're spinning at slightly different frequencies because the magnetization up here is different than the magnetization down here, then what will happen is they'll all be a little bit out of phase with each other. And I can, I can record the, the, the magnitude of that out of phase. So in this case, I would say this is zero degrees, right? This is about a, a 15 or 20 degree. This is about a 90 degree out of phase, right? This is about you know, 130 degrees. So from that, I can determine that therefore, if this is, 40, if this is at 90 degrees out of phase, it must be somewhere in the middle here. Right? So that's how you actually encode in the y-axis where something is situated. So again, I know that there's a different frequency in the x direction, different frequencies. In the y direction, I know that when I apply a gradient for a different duration of time, I'll get a slight uh, uh, offset in the phase that occurs. And that's what's shown here. Right? So I apply basically my slice select gradient and my read or frequency gradient, but notice what I'm doing is for my phase gradient, I'm applying it at different magnitudes, right? So this diagram here shows a gradient that's being applied. And the, the higher it is means the steeper the gradient you're applying. So if you apply a steeper gradient, you're going to cause then more of that dephasing, more of that phase offset to occur. And, and it's basically determining the magnitude of the phase offset uh, and the frequency that gives you then your MR signal back, all right? Now, the next step. Uh, so, yeah, one other thing that's important to keep in mind, so the amount of time it takes to generate my image is really a function of how many phase encode steps I need to do. So the more phase encode steps I need to do, because each time I have to do a phase encode step, so I apply a gradient of a small magnitude here, then I do another step where I apply a gradient that's a steeper magnitude, I apply an another step where I apply even steeper gradient, and I'm basically looking at, okay, what's the signal I get back for each of these, and what's the phase offset in each of these scenarios? And from that, you're able to solve for where it's located. All right, so what you get back is essentially information uh, of the relationship between the phase and the frequency. All right, now what you do with this information is then this process called Fourier transformation to actually decode the phase and frequency information to actually generate an image. All right, so this is where, you know, again, it gets very complicated, and so I want to keep this, you know, Simplistic, because you know, this would be something if you wanted to get an uh, engineering or physics degree, you could spend you know, months and months kind of going over this concept of Fourier transformation. But it's essentially it's taking information about the phase and frequency, and from that, decoding that information and uh, generating an image. But there's two things to keep in mind, that this, uh, uh, this information about phase and frequency actually contains two different pieces of information. There's the information which is in the center of k-space and the information which we call in the periphery, all right? The center lines give you information about image contrast. The peripheral lines give you information about image detail. And when you put these two together, then you get actually a nice high quality image where you have high detail or high spatial resolution as well as high contrast between different tissues, all right? And as we'll talk about things like MR angiography and things, it's important to know uh, when you're acquiring the center lines of k-space versus when you're acquiring the peripheral lines of k-space. So if you think about it, if you're doing an angiogram, you'd want to acquire the center lines of k-space, which correspond again to image intensity when the contrast has gotten to the area you want to image. All right. So, so you know, hang in there because this is we're gonna uh, 
move past some of this theoretical physics, all right, you know, and, I, and I commend uh, those of you that stayed for, for staying, because uh, I don't know if I would stay myself. Uh, <laughs> This is, this is hard stuff, you know, and this is not something you're going to get the first time. You have to go over this multiple times to try to understand it. Now this here, I think I want, you need to get the first time, which is, we're talking about safety. All right, and so this magnet is always on, and if you forget that, you are going to get fired, okay, or worse. All right, so this is a case where somebody starts to wheel in a bed, uh, which actually has metallic components to it, and that bed gets attracted to the magnetic field. Now what happens is, as it gets closer and closer, the magnetic field gets stronger and stronger. So it actually accelerates, so it becomes a missile, it becomes a projectile. So there's cases where there's deaths that have occurred. You know, somebody, you know, patient was short of breath, and so the patient said, let me bring in oxygen tubing. And boom, you know, the oxygen tubing goes, flies, and kills the patient. So, so this is one thing you need to remember, is safety is a paramount, and also remember the magnet is always on. It's not a case where at nighttime everybody's gone and lights are out that the magnet is off. The magnetic field is always present, okay? Um, so that static magnetic field, 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla, that's always there. So a few things that's important to recognize is that all personnel have to be trained as well as screened to work in an MRI environment and no exceptions to that. So if any of you rotate through the MRI lab, the first thing that the techs uh, should have you do is go through and fill out the MRI screening questionnaire and watch a safety video, okay? And that's, this is the last thing you want to forget. You can forget anything else I tell you when you're in your MRI month, but don't forget this, okay? Um, and then obviously it's important that we screen not only the personnel, but every patient. So every patient that comes through the MRI lab is gonna go through an extensive screening to make sure that there's nothing that they have that's MRI unsafe, all right? And also important to keep in mind it doesn't matter if the patient says, oh, doc, I just had a scan yesterday. You have to rescreen the patient every single time because something could have changed. They could have had something put in between the time of the last scan and this scan. So you need to always rescreen every patient. And then let's talk about what's MRI safe and what's not MRI safe, okay? And actually, before we do that, one other thing I want to talk about also need to be aware of is that people who have a history of working as machinists or welders, they need to be checked for metal fragments in their orbits, in their eyes, okay? Because if you have a small metal fragment in your eye, you go in the, the magnetic environment, that fragment can start moving around, and all of a sudden the patient can go blind, all right? So, so you know, if you're ordering an MRI scan, I always ask patients, is there any, do you have any metal in your body? Have you done any occupational welding or, or machining or grinding type work? Because if, if they have, they should get an x-ray of the orbits done before they come to the MRI lab so we can make sure that there's no retained foreign bodies, okay? Uh, same thing, obviously, if they tell you, oh, yeah, I've got some shrapnel or i got a you know, bullet or a pellet. We need to know about those things, okay? It uh, doesn't necessarily mean that, they, that, that the person cannot get imaged. depends, again, on what the location of it is, and you weigh the risks and benefits. Um, you know, if it's in a location where it could easily move around and cause serious damage, like in the orbits, uh, you, you obviously would not do the scan um, versus if it's, you know, something they've got in their buttocks or somewhere, or maybe it's not as, as life-threatening. So we'll evaluate those uh, those situations and try to figure out whether it's safe or not to do. The other thing that's important to keep in mind is that if there is an emergency in the MRI scanner, uh, what you do is you take the patient out of the scanner. Okay, that's the most important thing. Uh, get the patient out of the scanner and close the door. So you don't have the code team come running down uh, and everybody comes running with their stethoscope and everything else trying to go save the patient. Uh, because otherwise you're gonna have multiple codes going on at the same time. All right, you don't, we don't want that. All right, so, so last I'm going to talk about is this terminology, okay? So we've had a little bit of a shift. In the past, they used to use this terminology, MRI safe or MRI unsafe. Uh, and we've now gone to a three-tiered system, which is MRI safe, MRI unsafe, and MRI conditional. Now, most of the devices, let's say the pacemakers or defibrillators that, that are out now, that are, quote, labeled for MRI use, what label do they have? Safe. MRI safe, conditional, or unsafe? So they're actually labeled as MRI conditional. And, and what's the reason for that? So MRI safe, the definition actually is, this is something that is, has no known hazards in the MRI environment. So it's MRI safe and has really no metallic components to it. So a Petri dish, right? Uh, MRI unsafe obviously is something that is known to pose hazards in the MRI environment and therefore you don't want to do it. Like for example, ferromagnetic scissors, you don't want to, or like that bed that we saw there. That would be something you don't want to take into the room. 
MRI conditional, what it means is that it's an item that's been demonstrated to pose no known hazards in a specified MRI imaging environment with specific conditions of use, okay? That means that a certain field strength, a certain type of imaging. Uh, and here's why they went to that uh, different definition. So how many of you have been to Vegas? How many of you? That's it? Only one or two? Or no one admit to it? Okay. <laughs> So, so we've, we've had a few of you that have been to Vegas, so, so you've probably gone to that, uh, that new city center complex they had that came out you know, about 10 years ago now. Uh, there's a hotel there called the Vidara Hotel, which is uh, a beautiful glass structure. Thinking of taking a road trip to Vegas, be warned. The new MGM hotel there called the Vidara has been found to contain an extra you definitely don't want. It turns out when the sun's rays hit that curved building, it creates a 15 foot wide hot spot on the ground that is so brutal it can burn hair and skin and even melt plastic. Some unlucky hotel guests have been sent running from the pool area after being caught in what hotel employees are calling the death ray, a burning sensation from above. The hotel is rushing to fix the problem. Okay, so what's the issue there? So the issue there was, it doesn't happen all the time. It's a couple of days of the year when, it's actually just within a certain time of the day, a couple hour period, that the sun is in such a location that these sun rays all get magnified all onto one small area, a 10 by 10 foot area of the pool, right? So the idea with this is you could build this building and you could be in this pool 300 days of the year and you say, oh, it's safe. I've been here 300 times. You know, I've gone every day. But you don't know of every possible scenario that can happen. And, and that's why we use the term MRI conditional. It's tested in a certain set of circumstances and it's ought to be safe. <coughs> but it doesn't mean it in every, every po because you can't possibly test every possible permutation of circumstances. Um, so you always need to be aware of with any device that's Thinking of traditional that there still could be a risk of, of complications that can occur. And so one of the things that, that I recommend for all of you is there's a website you can go to called MRISafety.com. So if you, you're, you're on the floor and you're taking care of a patient or in the ICU or wherever, and you have a patient that needs a scan, but they have some kind of device in, well, you can just punch in the name of the device uh, under this area called the list, and it will actually tell you the particular device, what scenarios it's been tested in, and what it's labeling is. So it may say it's safe, in which case it has really no metallic components to it, it or most of the time it'll say it's conditional, and it'll tell you what conditions it's been tested in. So in this case, it's been tested both at 1.5 and 3 Tesla. It may say it's been tested for, you know, outside of the chest imaging or you know, total body imaging. But you need to know what condition it's been tested in. So you know, when we talk about devices, it's not just saying, oh yes, this device is MRI safe or not safe. It's really, it's conditional. It's conditional for what set of circumstances. Um, so that's probably you know, the, the most important message I hope you leave with today is with regard to the safety issues. And if there's ever a question, you can look it up on this uh, MRISafety.com website. Uh, and, and make sure if, when you're ordering a scan to, to communicate that to the lab. So, you know, in, in Epic, there's an order set, and in there it says, does the patient have devices? Put in if they do. If there's any question of them having anything, put it in there because we want to know about it. Um, and on the outpatient order forms, if you're in clinic as well, there's a, there's a place where uh, you, you check off if the patients have, have any device, and if so, we want to know exactly what kind it is. Um, so that's kind of probably my, my final take-home message here. Uh, and I want to thank you all for, for hanging, out, hanging on for this long. Uh, and we've got maybe one minute for questions, if there are any. How did you choose 37 degrees and 62 degrees? Well, I didn't choose those. <laughs> no, there's some physics reason behind it, but I, I don't really know what it is. Yeah, there's some, you know, when, many, many years ago when somebody was coming up with this, they came up with this as the optimal number. No, so most of those, most orthopedic implants, really from 1990s onward, are mainly made of titanium. Uh, so they're not ferromagnetic. Um, so they're typically, they'll cause an artifact, but they don't cause heating, and they don't, they don't attract to the magnetic field. So most of them are safe. Yep. Okay, any other questions? Are you 
The link devices? Yeah, most of those devices are, are labeled as MRI conditional. The only thing is we have to make sure we interrogate those devices beforehand. Because of the uh, position of the device, are you still able to give the, You're talking about the, the, the link in the yeah. Uh, PA? Yeah, but usually they, those are very... The link, not the uh, cardiomans, the links that are like the, the Medtronic the field monitor. Yeah, yeah, the uh, loop recorder. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, those, the, the, the amount of artifact it causes is not that much. Yeah. Most of them cause a fairly localized artifacts. So, so most of the newer devices now, they're attuned to the issues of MRI safety as well as MRI imaging artifacts, right? But yeah, I mean, the reality is, you know, some, sometimes you do get, you know, just the right amount of artifact over the area you're interested in imaging can be a problem. Okay, all right, well, thank you all for your attention.